is Billy Waters. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I want to start off with a question. Have you ever been around somebody or admired someone from a distance that you just thought before they pass on to, you know, be with Jesus, I would love to spend just four hours with them, just picking their brain, gaining wisdom, um, and just being with them and just gleaning as much as you can before they pass on. Uh, For me, there's probably two or three people in particular. One is Nelson Mandela. The second is Tim Keller. Uh, for very different reasons. Uh, <laughs> for Nelson Mandela, I would just love to hear, what, what was it like for close to three decades being locked in prison and, and fighting for a cause that's so much bigger than you, holding on to faith? And what was that like, um, being uh, grateful and faithful through those years um, and just being, having such a mark in history and, and making such a huge progress in South Africa and the world? For Tim Keller, it'd be like, what was it, you know, help me, pass, <laughs> like, just, you know, give me some of that, Keller anointing, you know, somebody says that the Protestants don't have a Pope. Yes, we do. We did. <laughs> Tim Keller. And just, like, what, what would you pass on to the next generation in regards to, to pastoring? So I don't know what, who, who your person or persons would be. Um, who, who would you go to in the last days of their life to glean wisdom about what it looks like to finish your life well? Um, the reason why I ask that question for you is because what we have here in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, this is the last chapter in our sermon series through the book of Daniel. Daniel, if you remember, he was pulled away from his home country when he was just a young teenager, and he has spent the, the, the remaining years, his entire life in a country that was not home. He went through various empires, various kings, and he stayed faithful to the end. He persevered to the end. He saw things, did things which were extraordinary. I mean, what he did in regards to being faithful to the things of God is staggering. Now, imagine if I was to say, don't ask me how I did this, but um, I'm grateful to announce to you this morning that we have Daniel, who's going to come preach to you. Uh, Again, I don't know how we were able to do this, but but he's going to come forward and he's going to preach and he's going to share with you what he wants to pass on to you so that you live your life faithful to the end. And what he would say is he would recapitulate the last few chapters of his book. And he says, well, if you've read my book, you would know that the Lord is calling us to be perseverant to the end through hardships, challenges, and sufferings. And there's a number of ways you can do that. First, you need to be people of prayer. Second, you have to have a posture of faith, as David talked about, that we need to have a perspective from above, keeping our eyes firmly fixed on the Lord who created us. Thirdly, we are called to be obedient in the moment, be faithful in the moment. And the fourth thing that Daniel would want to pass on to us, he would say, in some ways, this is the most important because those other two or three things come out of this. And in some ways, what I'd like to pass on to you is what I believe Daniel would say to us is really, I've saved the best for the last chapter. In order for you to be faithful to the end, to persevere to the end, we have to understand the idea that Daniel's communicating, that God is communicating through Daniel in Daniel 12. So what is it? What what is the thing that we need to be faithful to the end? Before we look at Daniel 12, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have gone before us, that you have fought the battle, and the victory is won. We thank you, Jesus, that you are high and lifted up, and that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you are king, you are Lord over all things. And we look forward to the day when we will be with you, walk with you, gaze upon your glory. And may we always keep that day in mind so that we can live faithfully in the moment now. It's in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to look at Daniel 12. If you have your scriptures, go there. Verses 1 through 4. At that time, Michael, angel, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not has happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, we talked about that last week, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine, shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up the seal Roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. 
A couple things I want to point out in this passage. First, this is a mirror, as we talked about last week, to verses 32 through 35 of uh, Daniel 11, which basically highlights there will be one who arises who will inflict persecution upon the people of God. So there will be suffering and oppression for the people of God, but the people of God will persevere to the end. Now, as we saw in Daniel 11, that was referring to really a specific time of 530 BC all the way up to 165 BC. But what we see in this passage is that this is the end times, in fact, the times that we're in now. Then it was applicable to those that were in the uh, BC, those uh, four or 500 years. But now this passage is applying to us. He's saying, be faithful to the end because there will come a time where we'll, we, where we'll stand before the judgment seat and there will be some who rise up, rise up to everlasting life and those to, who will be risen up to everlasting contempt and damnation, condemnation. There will be a day of judgment. But it's different than what he was talking about before because he was talking about a particular time um, back then, but now he's talking about throughout all of eternity. Also, he is ending this little passage by saying that the, it will be ro- the words will be rolled up into a scroll until the time, and you'll go from here and there to increase knowledge. Now, what the commentators will say is, is that what is happening is this is the authen- um, authentication of the scroll, that this scroll is in fact the word of the Lord because it is from the king, and that's why it's rolled up and sealed. It's authenticated. It is the true word of God. And those that st- uh, di- uh, stud- uh, dil- diligently study it will grow and increase in knowledge. Keep reading, verses five through seven. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, two others, one on the bank of the river and one on the opposite bank, okay, two. One of them said to the man, so another person, a third, a man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand toward the heaven and heard him swear by him who lives forever saying it will be for a time, times, and a half a time when the power of the holy people has been finally broken. All these things will be completed. What is happening? So we have two angels, one on one side of the river, another on the other, and then you also have one that's like the son of man clothed in linen, similar to what Daniel preached on, I'm sorry, what David preached on in Daniel chapter 10. Who is this person? We'll find out in just a second. And he speaks the word of a time, times, and a half a time. A time is one year, times is two years, and a half a time. One plus two is three plus a half three and a half. And as we've mentioned a number of weeks before, is that three and a half is a, is, is a perfect time, but yet not to the fulfillment, not to completion. It's, it's the perfect time of suffering and hardship for the people of God. In fact, that's what it says. When the power of the holy people has been broken, that is that they're going through a time of suffering, and it's a, it's a determined time, a completed time by which God ordains. So there's going to be times of suffering for the people of God. And they will be purified through it. That's what it says in verses 9 and 10. But then notice what happens to the people who are faithful to the end, verses 11 and 12. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. That equals three and a half years, what we just talked about. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. Okay, what is happening here? The three and a half years of suffering that the people of God are going to be going through is going to be triumphed by, overcome by the 1,335 days. What does that mean? It it simply means this, that 1,335 is a greater number than 1,290 The point that Daniel is making, actually the Lord through Daniel, is that for those who persevere through the 1,290 days, when you get to the end of that, past that 1,335 days, you will receive something. To put it another way, if you are faithful to the end, if you are faithful through the challenges and hardships and sufferings, you will receive something. What will we receive? Verse 13, as for you, go your way to the end You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to what? Receive your allotted inheritance. What is he saying? 
Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one who perseveres. To put it another way in the words of the gospel writer, the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. In the words of Daniel here, verse 13, blessed is the one who perseveres to the end because they will receive a rich reward. What is the big idea of Daniel chapter 12? Persevere to the end because we will receive the gift of eternal life. It's hope. It's hope. That's the point that Daniel's making. The power that allows us to persevere through hardship, trouble, and difficulty in life is hope. It's hope. And have you, um, what's the adage or the saying uh, in communication? Tell them what you're about to tell them. Tell them and then tell them what you just told them. That's exactly what Daniel does. Because in verse 3 at the very beginning, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. That's a reward. He tells them what he's about to tell them. And then he tells them, how long will it be for these astonishing things to be fulfilled? The reward. And then he tells them what he just told them at the very end. At the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. At the beginning, in the middle, at the end, he tells them to be faithful, to persevere to the end, even in the midst of suffering and hardship and difficulty. Why? Because of hope. There is power in hope. This is the most important thing that we could grab a hold of. You could say, what about faith? What about love? I mean, after all, Paul does say the greatest of these is love. Okay, good point. But, (laughs) and, and, in Colossians 1, Paul is admonishing the church of Colossae by saying, I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus, your love for all the saints, and what a faith and a love that spring from hope. Hope has generative power to increase faith and love within the people of God. That's why hope is so important. What will propel us through difficulty in life is hope. That's what Daniel wants to declare to his people then and what he wants to declare to his people now. Okay, so what is the power of hope? But then secondly, what is the nature of hope? First, the power of hope. There's actually two things. Uh, Hope gives us the power to persevere and also has the power to purify. First, it has the power to give us perseverance through challenging times. That's the point of the passage. The people of God are going through suffering. Persevere, why hope? Uh, I've mentioned this, I've used this illustration a number of times. I can't think of a better illustration for the power of hope. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychiatrist, uh, wrote a book called Man's Search of Meaning, and he was a Holocaust survivor. And even while he's um, in the concentration camp, he can't stop being a scientist. And so he's observing the people that are making it and the people that aren't making it uh, through the suffering. And he, he, he acknowledges or recognizes five different kinds of people. The first group of people, they started out with little to no hope, and they ended with no hope. And this was his observation about those who had no hope, period. With his loss of hope or belief in the future, he also, speaking of the person, he also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and became subject to mental and physical decay. Usually, this happened quite suddenly in the form of a crisis, symptoms of which were familiar to the experienced camp inmate. We all feared this moment, not for ourselves, which would have been pointless, but for our friends. Usually, it began with the prisoner refusing one morning to get dressed or wash or to go out on the parade grounds. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect. He just lay there, hardly moving. If this crisis was brought about by an illness, he refused to be taken to the sick bay or to do anything to help himself. He simply gave up. He died. Hope. Without hope. The other person who had a false hope on a particular day, they thought for sure that they had a vision that they would be released on a particular day. And because they had a false hope, that gave way. He talks about one person. um, We'll call him Fred. Uh, He had a prophecy that on March 30th, he felt like he had a prophecy, that he would be released. They would be released. When Fred told him about his dream, he was still full of hope and convinced that the voice of his dream would be right. But as the promised day drew near, the war news which reached our camp made it appear very unlikely that we would be free on the promised date. On March 29th, the day before, he suddenly became ill and ran a high temperature. On March 30th, the day his prophecy had told him that the war and suffering would be over, he became delirious and lost consciousness. On March 31st, he was dead. The third group of people, they just became brutal. They were being mistreated, so they just mistreated others, and that didn't work. Uh, The fourth group was a group that when they thought that when they got released, 
They, they would see their loved ones. And that experience would be commensurate upon all of the loss that they had experienced. But what they found is that it was a disillusioned hope. And this is what he writes about for that group. Woe to him who, when the day of his dreams, dreams finally came, found it so different from all that he had longed for. Perhaps he boarded a trolley, traveled out to the home which he had seen for years in his mind, and only in his mind, pressed the bell, just as he longed to do in thousands of dreams, only to find that the person who should open the door was not there and would never be there again. We all said to each other in camp that there would be no earthly happiness which could compensate for all that we had suffered. The last group was a group that had a hope that they were living for something and someone beyond themselves. And what he observes is it was that group that was able to persevere to the end. He says, they must not lose hope, but should keep their courage in the certainty that the hopelessness of our struggle did not detract from the dignity and its meaning. I said that someone looks down on earth of us in difficult hours, a friend, a wife, somebody alive or dead, and God. And he would not expect us to disappoint him. This is the point the only thing, the only thing that will allow us to get through times of suffering and difficulty is to have a rock solid living hope on that which is real. That's the power of hope is it allows us to persevere through times of challenge, difficulty, and even suffering. Uh, I, I reread for about, I don't know, the third or fourth time this week a book called Tortured for Christ by Richard Wormbrand. If you know anything about him, he grew up in the 20s, was born early in like 1909, died in 2001. Uh, and he was living in Romania uh, under communist, uh, underneath the communist regime. And he would say that the communism and Christianity are antithesis. I mean, they don't go together. Um, and he resisted, as an evangelical Lutheran pastor, he resisted the communistic regime. And as a result, he underwent incredible persecution and suffering, was in prison for 18 years, undergoing tremendous torture. When he tells one time in his book he was beaten like an inch from death. He's thrown back in his cell and all this, like the Lord comes down upon him and he is just filled with just such an inexpressible joy that his body comes to life and he testifies of dancing in his cell with joy. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's the power of hope. And he continues to go back to the hope of the risen Christ, hope of the risen Christ. He also mentions the, the nearness and the intimacy that you experience. This isn't masochism. This is union with Christ. Because what Paul talks about is, I desire, I make it my ambition to be not only understanding the power of his resurrection, but also the, also the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, that somehow sharing in his death, I may also share in the power of his resurrection. Sharing in his, not only his resurrection, we like that, but also sharing in the suffering of his death, of, his, of, his, of, of, of persevering through hardships and trials. And this is what he talks about. He, he mentions that he had four vertebrae broken over the course of 18 years, countless bones broken, body cut, burned, and 18 holes drilled in him. And yet he would say that in the persecuted church, he saw the most beautiful things. Out of his book, we felt the torture, but it often seemed as something distant and far removed from the spirit which was lost in the glory of Christ and his presence with us. I have seen beautiful things. I myself have been among the weak and insignificant ones in prison, but have had the challenge, have had the privilege to be in the same cell with great saints, heroes of the faith who equaled the Christians of the first centuries. They went gladly to die for Christ. The spiritual beauty of such saints and heroes of the faith can never be described." He is saying, in essence, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving present tense, not future, present, are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. That when you go through difficulty, hardship, and troubles in this life, you persevere because you have hope. What you are experiencing, not just in the future, but in that moment, in that moment, a glory a glory from the Lord that far outweighs anything that can come against you because you are found in Christ. So hope, the power of hope, allows us to persevere through hardship. But secondly, it also gives us the power to be purified. It purifies us. Notice in verse 10, it says, many will be purified. They will be made spotless 
and they will be refined. And then verse 13, how is that possible? We've read it three times. We're going to read it again. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. The hope that we have in the future gives us the power to live faithfully in the present. Do we know that we are going to stand before King Jesus? And that every moment that we live now is lived according to the time that we will be judged. We will be judged. In 1 Corinthians 3, it says that some of the things that we do, in the, the things that we do say in the body, things that we say or don't say, do or not do, will be judged. Some of the things that we do and say will be burned up like straw. Other things like gold and silver, it will be refined. In other words, it will last throughout eternity. Now, I know this is controversial regarding to rewards and eternity, but this is what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now imagine, there's going to be a day where we sit with Jesus is going to say, come here, let's sit down. And let's talk about how you stewarded this gift of life that I entrusted to you. How did you live it? How did you use your words? How did you use your body? How did you use your finances? How did you use your life for the glory of the kingdom? Every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have to give an account. And based upon how we live our life now will impact the rest of eternity. So I don't know how you need to respond. I don't. But I do know this, that we are all called to respond in humility, throwing ourselves at the feet of Jesus, knowing that it's grace upon grace upon grace. The point is this, are we living every moment for the day? For the day, that's our hope. I'm not talking about salvation, our salvation is in Christ. But there will come a day, there will come a day where we have to testify to what we've done in the body. Are we living every moment in light of that day? hope. It's a hope that cannot be taken away. It's living and it's active. You know, it, this, this life is a journey. Um, and this is what I found out about just like even in hiking. What you find out in your journey in life is like journey in hiking. You find out pretty soon what are the essentials and what are the non-essentials. I went on about a four-day, three-night hike through the Colorado, on the Colorado Trail when I was in college, and me and my buddy spent like about two weeks planning on what we were going to bring and what we were not going to bring. We were not going to bring like, um, I was not going to, a desk, a, a mattress, because <laughs> that's not my home. Now, I was taking only the essential things, the things that I absolutely, now I'm not talking about the, thing, the possessions in life of this world. I'm not talking about having possessions. I'm talking about, do the possessions have us? That's what I'm referring to, that we're living every moment in light of the day, that this is a journey through this life, and through this journey, what we find out is what is non-essential and what is essential. I was talking to a guy at a wedding a couple weeks ago, and he said, um, he gave this quote, he said, people pack what they fear. If you fear being hungry, you'll pack extra, too much food. If you fear being cold, you will overpack clothes. And what you find out in the journey, what was essential and what isn't. And what Jesus is, will say is, is, I'm the only thing that's essential. <laughs> Everything else is negotiable. And in this journey of life, as we journey to the hope, the land that has been entrusted to us, that is going to be given to us by King Jesus, we look forward to that day and we live our life in the present in light of that day. So, hope has the power, power to persevere, but then also the power to purify. Lastly, what is this hope? What is the substance of this hope? Is this hope a concept or is it a theory? Or what is it? If you look in Daniel chapter um, 12, verses 5 through 7, you'll see something astounding. He says, then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on the bank of the river and one on the other opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who is above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen who is above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and heard him swear by who lives forever, saying, it will be for time, times, and a half a time. Now, who is this person? You have two angels and a man who's dressed in linen. Who is it? Jesus. 
There was three in the fire. One was a son of man. Just as David preached on Daniel chapter 10, the man clothed in linen in glory is the second person of the Trinity, the pre-incarnate Christ. It is Jesus. And if you look, and this is what commentators say, that the way this passage is organized, it's what's called a chiastic structure. And we're going to throw up this image here in just a second. And this is what it means, is that verses 1 and 2 parallel 11 through 13. Verse 3 parallels verse 10. Verse 4 parallels 8 and 9. And what is at the center of it all is the climax of the passage. And what's at the center of the passage? Jesus. (laughs) So hope is not a theory. Hope is not an idea. Hope has a name. Hope has a face. Hope is a person. Hope is Jesus Christ. (laughs) We have a living hope. Why? Because Christ died. Christ was raised. Christ will come again. That's the essence of our hope. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We have a hope. And what is the hope? The hope is Jesus. And he has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Always be with us to the end and through the end. This week I was reading the mem- uh, Lewis Smith's memoir. And I want to close by reading this quote from his memoir. And especially for um, those that are in the fourth lap of your life, I think you might find this encouraging. Because this was in his fourth lap, actually right before he dies. And notice what he emphasizes in some of his last words. Again, Lewis Smeads. This is when I find myself now on the journey that God and I have been on at the station called Hope. It has been God and I the whole way. Not so much because he has always been pleasant company. Not because I could always feel his presence when I got up in the morning or when I was afraid to sleep at night. It was because he did not trust me to travel alone. Personally, I liked the last miles of the journey better than the first. But since I could not have the ending without first having the beginning, I thank God for getting me going and bringing me home and sticking with me all the way. Our journey in this life will have trouble and hardship. And what Daniel has been saying throughout his book is to be faithfully present. Be faithfully present to God, be faithfully present to others to the end. How? Be people of prayer. Assume the posture of faith. Be obedient in the moment. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And when hardships and troubles come your way, hold on to hope. Because that hope won't perish, it won't spoil, it won't fade. It's kept in heaven for you. Let's pray. Let us lift up our prayer requests to the God of hope. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I invite us all now, both silently and out loud, to offer our requests to God. Father, we lift up to you Ames Stanton, um, son of uh, Kyle Stanton, uh, assistant pastor at Trinity Anglican Littleton. He's a few weeks old, and he spent all those weeks in the hospital. God, we pray your protection over his brain. We pray your healing over his brain. We pray that you would dissolve the blood clot in his leg. Lord, protect that family. We also lift up to you Rick Stitcher. Thank you so much that um, his brain tumor is out. 
God, we pray comfort, healing, and peace on the whole Stitcher family. Hasten, O Father, the coming of your kingdom, and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Let's confess our sins now against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all of your sin through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness, sanctifying you through and through. And may the power of the Holy Spirit be upon you, restoring unto you the joy of your salvation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news that when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He not only cleanses us, but then he robes us with his righteousness. He gives us the ring and he calls us his own. Let's stand in victory, in peace, and in love. And this is an opportunity where we can pray blessing over one another by giving peace to each other and also meeting new people. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's greet one another, greeting one another with peace. Also, parents, you can pick up your children.